This is Nursing Australia, proudly brought to you by APNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association. Hello and welcome to this, the latest episode of the Nursing Australia podcast. I'm Matthew St. Ledger. Now, as a pandemic continues to meander along and ravage the state of New South Wales, nurses continue to be there along for the ride. I just want to shout out to everyone to make sure you are checking on each other, looking after mental health and wellbeing. This episode, we will be talking about health promotion, specifically women's health. Women's health needs to be at the mm. forefront and needs to be discussed and women need to feel safe and supported. Um, to have those discussions. So on that, it's September 2021. Happy Women's Health Week to all. And APNA nurses are on the ground in Broken Hill as COVID surge workforce nursing troops are rolled out. I want to start this episode by acknowledging the Willyakali people of the Bakinji Nation as the traditional owners of the land and pay our respects to elders past, present and future. Thank you so much to the people of Broken Hill for welcoming nurses from all across the state of New South Wales. And thank you to those nurses who have taken up the call. And the people coming through uh, seem to be in reasonable spirits and uh the ones coming through are keen to have the vaccine and then spread the message through their through their family and friend network. So I think that will pick up. Later in the episode, we will be discovering an exciting CPD portal to ensure that we're providing the most inclusive, person-centred care for those in our community that have intellectual disabilities and autism spectrum disorder. Many of these registered nurses find themselves graduating and working in clinical practice and then encountering people with intellectual disability and or autism and struggling to know how to communicate. And remember, if you are listening on Apple or Google Podcasts, please don't forget to tap the subscribe button and on Spotify, click to follow. But first, let's hear the latest in healthcare news. Again, welcome to Nursing Australia. Nurses sitting ducks without boosters. Self-administration of ivermectin appears to spike. ANMF warns against planned reopening and APNA postpones the conference roadshow until 2022. This is Nursing Australia News. Hello, I'm Mitch Wall. A major healthcare provider is warning that doctors and nurses who were fully vaccinated early will be sitting ducks if boosters are not in arms by October. Catholic healthcare bosses are warning that frontline healthcare workers vaccinated back in February may not have the immunity to the Delta strain in coming weeks. This is based on recent evidence suggesting immunity wears off almost entirely after eight months. Australia has seen a tenfold increase in the import of ivermectin, a drug typically used to deworm livestock. Ivermectin has gained momentum in recent months, as some suggest it's a treatment for COVID. Experts warn, however, there's insufficient evidence to support these claims. The TGA, Pharmaceutical Society of Australia and US FDA have issued a warning against its use. The FDA posted on Twitter, you are not a cow. Despite being unproven as a COVID treatment and dangerous for humans in high doses, ivermectin has received a recent boost from online misinformation, prompting warnings from the FDA and other health officials. The FDA tweeting last month, you are not a horse, you are not a cow. Serious y'all, stop it. Australian hospitals have reported a spike in patient admissions for ivermectin overdose, which typically presents as gastro symptoms and can result in significant renal impairment. The Australian Nursing and Midwifery Council has written to the PM urging the federal government to reconsider their planned reopening strategy. The council is urging the Morrison government to consider workforce capacity and fully assess vaccination targets to include the entire population, not just the eligible cohorts prior to proceeding with reopening. And finally, APNA has made the call to move the remaining APNA conference roadshow events to early 2022 due to the current situation across the country. This follows the postponement of the September events a couple of months ago. Find a link in the show notes to view all the new February 2022 dates. Because of the shift, early bird registrations have reopened and will now close on the 1st of November. Happy Women's Health Week 2021 to all. I just want to talk about preventative health strategies broadly. So things like health screening seem to have become part of the collateral damage of the pandemic. But frankly, data is suggesting that health promotion, positive messaging and engagement around mind, body, health and well-being has never been more vital. We really need to be mindful that we need to avoid burnout, particularly in times 
um, of high stress, stress and high pressure uh, like we're experiencing now. So Brenda and Janet form an integral part of the team at the Jean Hales Foundation. They are the Women's Health Masterminds of Australia. They stop by to chat women's health, its importance, the stigmas, pandemic impacts, and remind us that women really do continue to bear the brunt of COVID-19. So, so why, why is women's health so important? Why is it so important for you to that the messaging is strong and that the conversation is always happening in relation to, to women's health? Why, why is that front and centre? Yeah, I think I think it's for so many years it didn't. So, you know, if we go right back to when Jean Howes as an organisation and Janet's mum was a GP, it wasn't talked about. Women's health was well and truly under the under the rug and everybody was encouraged to keep it there. And that was to no one's benefit, particularly mm -hmm. particularly women who for many years and with many issues suffer have suffered those in silence um, and not been given the support they need. And that is just not on. It's something that we as an organisation you know, feel very strongly about, that women's health needs to be at mm -hmm. the forefront and needs to be discussed and women need to feel safe and supported um, to have those discussions whether it's at work or whether it's with their doctor, or the health professional, and feel that they can raise those any issue that they want. And if they don't get the answers they need, then they should also feel very comfortable to go look for it elsewhere. Do you think there's an element of destigmatizing mm -hmm. the subject matter? I think that's a fantastic question, Matthew, and one which we've been talking about a lot, particularly as there's been a lot of talk about menopause in the media in the last few months, a topic that has particularly attracted both government attention um, and media attention is endometriosis. I mean, talking about things like heavy bleeding, heavy periods, there's a huge amount of stigma attached to that. And another topic which attracts a lot of, is surrounded by stigma is a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome. Now, as one woman with polycystic ovary syndrome said, who would put up their hand and talk about a condition that makes you potentially centrally obese, potentially with increased body and facial hair and uh, challenges with fertility sometimes and also challenges with mental health? You're not going to put your hand up and say, look, this is what I want to talk about today. Uh, but those three conditions, if we just pick three, have been surrounded by silence. Mm. and stigma and 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 on women's health week brenda what is one thing you'd like nurses to take away from women's health week oh in a way it's the same message that we want all women to take away from women's health mm. week but i think for nurses and the role that they play in in health it's probably even more important and that is to look after themselves and it is, and you know, male and female nurses, obviously, but we're obviously, you know, talking about women in, mm. in this regard, but they are there on the front line looking after everybody all the time. And, and I think COVID has certainly, you know, raised that level up even higher for, for these um, frontline workers. And they're not looking after themselves properly. And for all of us, we can't do our job. We can't look after others unless we look after ourselves. And, you know, we know plumbers are usually got a leaky tap in their own house. Nurses don't have great health a lot of the time because they're just so busy and so focused, which is what we love about them. But we really want Women's Health Week for them to be a reminder that they need to take that time and they need to prioritise their own health, their health checks, and their mental health and their physical health as well. So that, that really is, it's the key message across Women's Health Week for everybody, but uh, for nurses, definitely. It, it's interesting, there's some pretty alarming statistics that have come out just recently um, about um, health screening broadly and throughout COVID, how preventative health, health screening has really fallen off the wagon. So I guess that applies to every, everyone. It's, it's nurses in, in their, their own health, um, nurses in the provision of education to consumers and patients, but just broadly as a society, you know, cancer screening is a, is a great example, HPV. It's just the numbers have dropped off, I guess, if we've sort of insulated ourselves and, and become, I guess, closed off. So I guess that's for me, something that grabs me um, about Women's Health Week, why it is so vital that, that 
there are these conversations, there are these promotional opportunities. So people don't forget that, yes, COVID is is big and it's it's important, but we can't forget about everything else and, yeah. and potentially the sort of collateral damage, both mentally and physically, that, that um, COVID can have to, you know, 50% of the population. It's very true, Matthew. And, and we know that women bore the brunt and are still bearing the brunt of COVID. Mm -hmm. the, the, the working from home, the homeschooling, the, the juggling of everything. It's women are at the forefront, the carers and the nurturers. We, we know that in, the, in yeah. many cases. And a lot of us have elderly parents. Some of us, my mother is in a retirement home, in a mm. aged care home. That's, you know, that's a concern teenage children we get caught in the middle of that a lot and it's last year our focus for women's health week was on health checks was that reminder to to women not to let COVID get in the way of their their mammograms and their cervical cancer screenings but we know it did and we mm. still see a reluctance um even this year because everybody's up and down of do I really need to go to the doctor? No, I'll put it off for another few weeks till it, everything settles down again. But yep. I think the constant in and out of lockdown this year is in some ways playing more havoc even than mm. last year. That And we do need to keep that conversation, encouraging women. It's okay to go and have your health check. It's mm -hmm. okay to go and still see the doctor. Yeah, I can't bang the drum of preventative health more. And that's why organisations such as Jean House and, and Women's Health Week are really, I think, are really vitally important anyway. Matthew, I can tell you just a little anecdote with, I heard from um, we, from our evaluation survey last year from Women's Health Week that yeah. a woman sent me an email and said, I just want to let you know that this is my third year I've been involved in Women's Health Week and I now take that whole week off work and it is my week and I check in and I go to the dentist, I go and have my mammogram, I have my screenings. And she dedicates that whole week now wow. to herself. And then she finishes it on the Friday and goes out and has a lovely lunch with, with some friends, which is is a great way. Not that we can all that do that, but fantastic, fabulous. Fantastic, Brenda. What a and great she, story. It's in the calendar. She knows that's her week. Wow. And I, I love that and I wish I wish we could all do that. It's a it's a wonderful, you know, way to celebrate the week. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it's, you know, just as you said, that conversation and that workplaces, you know, if a, if a woman says, I've got to go and have my mammogram today, I'm taking an extra long lunch. Yay, that's yeah. great. Jean Howes for Women's Health is Australia's leading and most trusted women's health organisation. They are a national not-for-profit group dedicated to improving women's health. Now, Women's Health Week kicks off Monday, September 6th and runs through until Friday, September 10th, 2021. To receive the latest updates or to find out more about hosting your own event, sign up at womenshealthweek.com.au. And if you do miss the festivities of Women's Health Week 2021, don't worry, it is not too late to get involved uh, with women's health and to upskill and engage and find out more and, and frankly, look after yourself and one another. There'll be links in the show notes for more info. If you're a practice nurse, Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander primary healthcare worker or a DVA contracted community nurse, APNA in conjunction with the Department of Veterans Affairs are offering free education to help deliver the best possible care to patients enrolled in the Coordinated Veterans Care Program. If you have patients enrolled in CVC, you can now access these fully funded education modules specifically on chronic disease management and care planning. Nurses are the leaders of chronic disease management in primary care. By completing this education, you'll be able to coordinate an effective team approach and help support veterans with self-management and goals of care. To enrol in the program, head to www.apna.asn.au and click on the Your Profession tab to find out more. Early on in this pandemic, it was feared that a COVID outbreak in a rural, remote First Nations community could be potentially devastating. Sadly, this fear has materialised in recent weeks as COVID has now made its way into some of our most vulnerable communities where health outcomes are already far lower than the national average. So the scramble to have nursing troops feet on the ground is well underway. A surge workforce has been established to assist in stemming the flow of COVID-19. 
APNA put out the call and have secured the support of 130 nurses. APNA President Karen Booth has been deployed to the Mariah Ma Health Service in Broken Hill, which is in far western New South Wales, along with many other APNA nurses who have relocated from right across the state of New South Wales. Karen shared the group's experience with Nursing Australia to give us an on-the-ground perspective as this potential public health emergency continues to unfold. Um, thanks for joining us, Karen. Thanks, Mitch. Glad to be here. Um, paint me a picture of what it's like out there in Western New South Wales on the ground at the moment. Uh, look, it just seems quiet and there's a big New South Wales health hub that has got a drive-through clinic and I think the progress there, getting people to come in, has been slow. And this is my, uh, I think, eighth day now out here at Broken Hill. And in the Aboriginal Medical Service at Murray Ma, where I'm working, the respiratory clinic is just quietly ticking over. And it was a bit slow last week, but there was a large part of the community, certainly the Aboriginal community, who were in uh, lockdown because they'd been to the funeral in Wilcannia. And their lockdown uh, or quarantine at home finished on the weekend for most of them. And we know there are a few families who are positive and are still in, in a home quarantine. And uh, the Aboriginal Health Service is wonderful. They've been doing food drops to them, daily phone calls, checking that everyone's okay. So they really do have a very uh, efficient but also really caring service out here. And tell me, what, what are the sort of impacts of the virus that you're seeing out there? Um, there's some reports that we're hearing of um, people camping in tents so they can self-isolate. I think that's at Wilcan so that's at Wilcania. I haven't seen any tents here and I haven't been to Wilcania. They're trying to keep people uh, from the health service. Murray Mallet does Broken Hill and Wilcania. I think they're trying to keep the, the team separate uh, in case, you know, someone gets sick or they, and they need to swap people around. Um, I think the people are intense because it is helpful for them to self-isolate. Often you have multi, multiple generations living in a house and so to be able to isolate in, I think New South Wales uh, government is going to open up and set up uh, temporary housing in Caravan Park so that people can self-isolate there. They're just setting up facilities now. In Broken Hill, it's very quiet. Of course, everyone's at home. The shops are closed except for the food outlets, but it, here it's been fairly quiet. Um, we've still got people coming in uh, to the health service but, of course, under very uh, strict uh, COVID management uh, entry and exits. And tell me, um, with Indigenous healthcare, um, how is that different from, from run-of-the-mill healthcare and, and what are the intricacies, I suppose? That's a very good question and probably one that I'm not totally across. It... Um, I think there's a lot more uh, community interaction and the health workers they have here um, in the team are amazing. They have uh, wonderful people skills, but they're also really, really clever um, health professionals. And a lot of the uh, health workers, the Aboriginal health workers, are on a training pathway to be health Aboriginal health practitioners, and some are also uh, on a training pathway eventually to do their registered nurse training. So it's a wonderful, wonderful, um, I think, uh, breeding grounds probably the wrong word, but mentoring process for these young people coming through the system to support their community through healthcare. And tell me, what's happening with the local workforce out there and how is the surge workforce um, helping out? 
Uh, it, it, when we came, uh, you know, a week ago, uh, there was a large number of the team were in uh, isolation. They'd had a positive case in the clinic, but not through the respiratory clinic, had come into the regular part of the clinic. So a large number of people were um, having to isolate at home. The search workforce uh is really interesting. We have uh, my friend Caroline and I are here, both accredited nurse immunisers, very experienced uh, primary health care nurses, and Caroline's done remote area nursing. The other nurses that I've met are all at clinical nurse specialist or clinical nurse consultant levels who've come uh, through either through contract or through direct appeal through APNA and Marimar. New South Wales Health have a lot of nurses here as well, but they've come up uh, from the city, and uh, but they're servicing the hospital. And again, I, I think very highly qualified nurses. They're probably the only people you see walking around town, and every coffee shop has a queue of nurses out the front, and you can tell by their scrubs who they are. And tell me, um, from what you're seeing out there, you know, are the worst fears that, that we're hearing in the media going to be realised or, or do we think we've semi-dodged a bullet in this situation? Look, I think on the whole people have been really cooperative and there's certainly very few people in this street, as I said, either getting food or, you know, the odd person going into the chemist shop. Uh, everything else is closed and there's not... People, people are, are being very careful. Everyone I've seen has had a mask on. Everyone is obeying the social distance laws. The, uh, the schools, of course, are closed. But the people coming through, I've done vaccination clinic for the last few days, and the people coming through uh, seem to be in reasonable spirits and uh, the ones coming through are keen to have the vaccine and then spread the message through their through their family and friend network. So I think that will pick up. And as I said, we're just it's I think it's simmering because we know there's COVID um, a high level in the sewage treatment works and the odd additional case uh, popping up. There's been, I think, fortunately, no deaths here. And I know of one airlift to um, to Adelaide Hospital. But, uh, it, yeah, it's just kind of sitting. And hopefully the community here have acted really quickly and it won't get, um, there won't be too much more. Now, if you are interested in joining the APNA Surge workforce, an expression of interest link is in the show notes. So too is a link to subscribe to APNA's weekly newsletter, The Connect, keeping nurses in the know. This podcast is brought to you by APNA, the Australian Primary Healthcare Nurses Association, and is only made possible by our members. Join today. Google APNA membership. 45% of nurses reported feeling regularly or sometimes isolated, alone or lacking support from other nurses in our 2019 workforce survey. So we've been cooking up your newest member benefit, the APNA Online Community, a space for members to seek support, advance their knowledge and share their own knowledge. The online community is not only a forum, but also a member directory, a news hub, an events calendar, and a video library all in one spot. Head to www.apna.asn.au to log in and start using your new member benefit today. Ongoing professional development and education is every nurse's business. Nurses strive to provide the best health outcomes for our patients, but what about those patients that present with intellectual disabilities and or autism spectrum disorder. How confident are we in our assessment techniques? How capable uh, do you, we think we are? And I'm not for a minute criticizing uh, nurses. Um, it's more uh, perhaps broadly a, a criticism of, of mainstream nursing curricula because if most of us cast our minds back to study um I can't recall ever touching on units about intellectual disability, ASD. They're notably absent. And really the only exposure that you, you tend to get is, is via clinical practice. And as we know, in those initial triage, those initial assessment phases uh, with a patient, uh, really vital information can be 
missed. And, and the, you know, statistically, we know that those with intellectual disability, for example, have more disparate health outcomes. So now that gap is being addressed by a free online CPD portal. This way, by jumping on and doing these courses, we can ensure as nurses, we're providing the best holistic and most importantly, inclusive person-centered care. So I guess just to kick things off, firstly, Nathan, welcome to Nursing Australia. Can Thank you me. tell me what is every nurse's business? So if every nurse's business is, um, I think, the first ever opportunity for nurses across the whole of Australia to learn through um, a free CPD program about people with intellectual uh, disability and or autism and the disparate health outcomes that they experience and the problems that they encounter when trying to access the mainstream health system. The key thing is, and, and, the, and the research literature is quite clear on this, is that um, registered nurses, before they become registered um, in their undergraduate training, don't learn um, much, if anything, about uh, people with intellectual disability and or autism, and in particular, the health disparities that they face. And so many of these registered nurses find themselves graduating and working in clinical practice and then encountering people with intellectual disability and or autism and struggling to know how to communicate uh, with people. But they, they encounter problems around, you know, capacity, you know, consent. Um, and the, the literature about nurses working in the mainstream health setting and their struggles to work effectively with people with intellectual disability and autism is quite clear. And so the idea of every nurse's business is to create a national resource uh, that nurses can access where they can actually learn a little bit more about people with intellectual disability and or autism. And I think the, the most important point to make here is that you know, this, this is not about suggesting that, you know, registered nurses, um, you know, should, they should know more. Um, the fact is that our education system is the way that it is. Um, this is about making those amazing nurses even more amazing and, and um, improving the way that they work with uh, people with intellectual disability and or autism to enhance their health outcomes. Yeah, on that, I, I mean, I... When I signed when I signed up to do the the every nurse's business um, you know, program online, that there's the the pre learning quiz, and I won't, I won't no spoilers uh, for those who haven't done it yet. But it it really did identify for me, put my hand up and say there's significant gaps in learning, and and uh, you know all the minimal experience I've had is purely through clinical exposure. So yeah, uh, yeah it was pretty jarring, but certainly a really positive experience I found personally doing. Yeah. Yeah, and look, you know, you're 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 not alone in you know finding that um, you know you graduate from university and then encounter you know a part of the Australian population that you know very little about, you know, and you know it it's it's very clear that not only do people with intellectual disability and or autism have you know more chronic and complex health conditions, they have greater rates of hospitalisation, they have longer hospital stays. They have more readmissions and complications following hospitalisation. They um, are at risk of earlier mortality. Um, so, you know, as, as a part of the Australian population, and, and it's, you know, th there are various estimates out there depending on your definition, but it's between two and 3% of the Australian population. You know, that's a large swathe of very vulnerable Australians that, you know, um, need, uh, you know, a more specific type of nursing practice. How, how much time do you think um, nurses would need to um, put towards this? Um, well, I think the, the, what, what we've done is we've, we've recognised that there's going to be different nurses in different contexts that want different levels of knowledge. Mm. So we've created three levels on the learning side. Um, the first is the foundational uh, level, and that, that's just a series of... Um, key pieces of information that are that are portrayed maybe in a short video or a short animation or a you know a, a tile with you know key facts and and figures and so on 
Mm-hmm. The nurses that then maybe want to know a little bit more, let's say, for example, you're, you're a nurse that works in, you know, a GP clinic in an area where there are a lot of group homes and a lot of people with a disability living in that area. And, and mm-hmm. so the, the, the practice has got a lot of patients with intellectual disability and or autism. And so you can then do the intermediate knowledge and also then a quiz at the end of it that's worth four hours towards um, CPD. And then for those nurses who maybe feel that this is an area that they maybe want to become a little bit of a champion for, um, we have the advanced content. And uh, that's a little bit different as um, the advanced content um, not only includes the inter- some of the interactive content that's in the intermediate and foundational, but there's also an independent um, research project there's a series of synchronous learning sessions on different topics and area of practice and they start tomorrow. Nurses will be able to log on to that um, synchronous learning session, which will be facilitated by um, a nurse who's a um, Australian expert in uh, nursing and people with intellectual disability and um, an opportunity to chat, you know, as, as a small group Um, about some of the key issues uh, that nurses face in practice. So really it's just up to the nurse and and what the individual nurse wants to get from it and how much time they want to put into it. And then if you complete the the, the learning material at the foundational, intermediate and the advanced levels, there's the option to complete an assessment task that will be examined by um, some of us uh, members on the team. And uh, it'll be the equivalent of, of um, AQF level eight at postgraduate study that could be presented as a package to a university if you were to get a master's degree, you know, for advanced standing and so on. So it's, it's been structured in such a way to, you know, meet the needs of those nurses who want to know just a little bit and, and be more um, attuned to some of the, the key facts and figures all the mm-hmm. way up to nurses that feel that they maybe want to become a champion um, mm. in, this, in this area. Be sure to check out the show notes of this episode for the link to the Every Nurse's Business free CPD portal. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. In the coming weeks, there's a very special episode of the Nursing Australia podcast on the cards as we welcome Andrew Denton to help us explore voluntary assisted dying. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast listening app and be across all the APNA socials for the latest updates. Thank you so much for listening to this episode and to all of us out there, genuinely stay safe. I'll catch you next time. Nursing Australia, the podcast for Australian nurses working together towards a healthier Australia. For more information, please visit us at www.apna.asn.au. Thanks for listening to Nursing Australia.